uh, Professor Francesca Chiaramonte. Uh, she is the Dorothy and J. Lloyd Huck Chair in Statistics for the Life Sciences and Director of the Genome Sciences Institute here at Penn State. She's well known for her research on developing statistical methods for complex high dimensional data uh, and she's particularly well known for her research in dimension reduction. Uh, she is an interdisciplinary scientist as well and she's worked closely with scientists in very many disciplines and here just uh, a subset of them is biomedical sciences which is perhaps her biggest focus uh, and then meteorology and economics. She's received many honors for her work. She's a fellow of the American Statistical Association, the Institute of Mathematical Statistics, and on and on. Uh, very recently, she gave the Geyser Distinguished Lectureship at the University of Minnesota. Um, so, and she's been a very popular mentor to students, postdocs, junior faculty, uh, has multiple international collaborations, including work with the Santana School of Advanced Studies in Pisa, Italy, where she serves as a scientific coordinator of the Department of Excellence for Economics and Management in the Era of Data Science. It's a long thing. <laughs> um, so Thank you. So, okay, now it's my turn. And uh, I want to thank Merle and Casey and Juan uh, uh, for all the help that they're giving with this. Uh, I want to thank you all for being here. Uh, I want to ask the colloquium students to take lots of notes because then I'm going to ask them to trash me later, so do take notes, okay? And um, I have a bit of an option now to either try and stick to my script, which is going to make this very smooth and controlled, but I'm Italian, I don't think I'm going to be able to do that. So if I'm going to wander around in circles and move my hands a lot, and it's going to be just fine. Forgive me in advance. So you see the title of my talk today up there, and it contains a question, which is, what can shapes teach us? I hope to be able to provide you with an answer, okay? And I'm gonna try to do that, hooking with, connecting with biomedical applications, especially two applications that I will be describing later. So this is the slide for the questions. I will be speaking in particular about functional data analysis. And the first part of the lecture is going to be sort of a general introduction, which I'll try to make very non-technical, very intuitive to the extent that I can. So wish me luck, and let's hope that I can do this the right way. I don't think I have to convince anyone here that we live in a time of data deluge. Science, the economy, government, our daily lives have all been revolutionized by an increasing availability of massive and complex data that we live and swim into all the time. Uh, but today we're going to be, as I was saying, focusing on a special type of complex data that happens to be also very structured. And we call this functional data. So let me put aside for a second the word functional, which sounds very mathematical and unfriendly maybe to some, and let's go through some examples which I'm sure are going to resonate with many of you, with many of us, uh, and give us some intuition. So the first example I'm putting up, it's a classic. Okay, these are growth curves. And this is a very famous data set called the Berkeley, Berkeley data set. On uh, the left, you see the growth curves themselves. And right next to them, you see their derivatives. One of the reasons why functional data is very interesting and useful is because it allows us to use the concept of derivative, of velocity. Okay? The second type of examples I'm going to mention, I'm calling the troubling. Okay? These are curves that we have all become very familiar with, sadly, in the last years. On the left, you see case curves describing the COVID-19 epidemics in various parts of the world. And on the right, you see curves associated with climate change, temperatures in particular. Those represent the uh, portion of the US land area that were affected by uh, uh, overly high temperatures as, it, as this portion evolved over time. The third type of examples that I'm, I'm gonna mention, I'm calling the high tech. These are data produced by fancy contemporary technologies. Okay. On the left, you see the curves that 
represent activation of the brain measured through fMRI data. And on the right, you see curves representing the functioning of the heart measured through wearable devices. So all of these are examples, as I was saying, of what we call functional data. And when you think of a functional datum, you should think of a, a subject, a statistical unit, if you will, uh, on whom we measure a quantity. This is what I'm mapping on the vertical axis as it unfolds on a continuous domain that I'm representing on the horizontal axis. This domain could be time. It's the easiest way to think about this. Okay? Uh, so uh, the power of this is in the fact that the shapes of the curves contain a lot of information that we can leverage. And as I hope I convinced you of with the few examples I made before, uh, functional data can arise and be particularly interesting in many scientific domains. Here I'm uh, uh, using little cartoons to indicate the biomedical sciences, economics, the climate sciences, but the list goes on and on. Another thing that you may want to know is that in principle we can extend this reasoning. We can have surfacing unfold, surfaces unfolding over 2D domains and the easiest thing to think of is space, a region but we're not gonna go there today. So again, the power of this is that if we consider functional data and we use appropriate methods, techniques to analyze it, we can leverage a, the very rich informational content of shapes. And uh, before we go on though, I'm gonna need to bring us all back to reality because what we get at least at the very beginning of the story, are not really curves, okay? In practice, uh, the quantity that we're interested in is measured discreetly, okay? On a certain number of points along the domain, okay? You can imagine some sort of an underlying gridding on which we're taking the measurement. And just to hook us up, uh, let me try and present you with a totally made up story, okay? This is gonna be nothing concrete, just an example that I made up to tell you a story as I showed you the slides. Let's say that we are measuring uh, the ability to oxygenate, oxygenation of the blood, on a, num on a number of subjects, John and Jane are two among them, uh, that are undergoing a respiratory illness. So the domain is actually the duration of the illness, and we're taking these measurements that are relative to a baseline, which is why you see these curves going up and down and possibly cross into the negative uh, um, under the zero line. So maybe we do these measurements uh, uh, every day or potentially every day on a fine gridding that is represented here by days. And maybe John lives closer to a clinic so he can go in and be measured more often than Jane, okay? So these measurements are discrete and they need not coincide, okay, across people. Uh, the second important thing that happens is that these measurements are actually taken with error, okay? Uh, for instance, the pulse oximeters at the clinic may have uh, a limited degree of accuracy and these measurements are going to be taken with error. So this is how the data actually looks like when we get it. Fortunately, there is a first very important class of, of techniques in the Functional Data Analysis Toolkit that serves exactly the purpose of reconstructing curves starting from the discrete measurements that we get. And this is called smoothing. So smoothing essentially takes the points and turns them into curves. And uh, this allows us essentially to bypass the need for these measurements to be synced, okay? Individuals can have different number of measurements taken at different points in time. Another very cool thing about smoothing is that it allows us to do a sort of house cleaning job, okay? It allows us to mitigate the errors that we have when taking this measurement. So you can think about it a little bit like removing, mitigating irrelevant vertical variation that we have in our data. Uh, 
of course, we don't just do the smoothing for John and Jane here. We do the smoothing for everyone in our data set. And let me put down here just a few more keywords. I'm really not going to explain these things, but just so that you, that you have seen them if you may be interested. Um, these are different ways that people can do smoothing. If you want to get some intuition about this, think of a moving a local average. Okay? You scroll down the points you have and you compute an average locally and you move along. But there is no need for this to be an average. It could be a local fitting of a polynomial curve that allows you to produce the curves. Statisticians also love to, to smooth with kernels. And statistician, statisticians working in functional data analysis particularly like a, a smoothing tool that is called splines. I need to make a warning here, and it's one of two that I'll make during the lecture. When we do smoothing, uh, we're using a knob, okay? A knob by which we modulate what we consider noise to be cleaned up, and what we consider a systematic signal, okay, as we build the curves. There are approaches that one can use to make this, you know, tune this knob in as objective and, and data-driven a way as possible, but there is always an element of subjectiveness in this. There's an element of human judgment. I'm going to move on to a second issue we need to tackle, which is that people ain't exactly the same. People illnesses may not be exactly the same. Okay? So these curves, once we have estimated them, may be sort of displaced with respect to one another in a way that is person-specific. You can think of this as saying that the domain is actually a subject-specific domain. Uh, the example here would be that this point where oxygenation starts going back up, maybe that's the turning point, to turning the corner in the illness, may come later for Jane than it does for other people. Okay? So what am I talking about here? I'm identifying with you, for you, a landmark in the illness, and I'm telling you that Jane's landmark comes a little later. Okay? Now this could be interesting in and of itself. We may want to study how people differ in terms of when is it that they turn the corner, or not. Maybe we're interested in understanding how oxygenation deteriorates before the landmark and improves afterwards. And the fact that people have different landmarks becomes a confounder, okay, a hindrance. So what we can do to, to ameliorate this problem is use another class of tools that are, belong to the registration bag, or alignment, sometimes people say. Essentially, we can manipulate these curves a little bit. We can shift them around. We can rescale them a bit. We can warp the way every curve unfolds along a person-specific domain in a way that, make pers that makes persons more comparable to each other. This would be the idea. I think of it a little bit as if I were putting into focus before taking a photograph. Okay? I want to move things around a little bit in such a way that they come into better focus. And another way of thinking about this, which kind of parallels what I was saying before, is that we are eliminating irrelevant horizontal variation this time. Smoothing uh, tackles irrelevant vertical variation. Registration tackles irrelevant horizontal variation. Okay? Also here, of course, we're registering everybody, not just Jane, and people register using landmarks, which is the intuition I was trying to draw upon here. But people also register trying to get as close as possible to a reference curve, for instance, the average curve or a principal component curve. Um, warping functions are a registration tool particularly beloved by functional data analysts. Also here, like for the smoothing, there is a warning concerning human judgment because we need to decide what is it that is relevant and what is it that is not. Okay? I hope I have you all with me. All right, so now that we've done all these things, I'm going to put them under the general label of preprocessing. We have constructed the curves. We have registered them to one another as necessary. We finally have the curves. 
not just for Jane and John and a few other people, but for the whole bunch of subjects that we had in our data set. And now we can go back to bragging and saying, yes, shapes are packed with information. What do we do with it, though? Right? And the answer to what do we do with it is just about anything you want. The functional data analysis toolkit, in fact, has functional versions of most of the statistical methods that, that you know already, that you're familiar with. Okay? So there are many, many things that you can do with them. And today I'm focusing on two. Oh, the fonts is, OK. Um, one is regression, and the other one is clustering. Okay? So there is a functional version of regression, and there is a functional uh, version of clustering. In the functional version of regression, uh, uh, you can do many interesting things. Your response variable can be functional. You can have response curves. <laughs> And you can regress these response curves on um, standard numeric predictors, or you can regress response curves on curves themselves, or you can have a standard numeric response and regress them on curves, and so on and so forth. There are many ways of mixing and matching uh, different types of variables, some of which may be curves and some of which may be standard ones. Uh, in functional clustering, what you do is you, you try and identify some sort of distinct typical patterns and group the curves depending on which pattern they seem to follow to be close, closest to. Um, I'm going to say a bit more about functional regression, trying to stay very simple. Uh, I'm going back to my made-up little story. Uh, so here are these curves of the ability to oxygenate for many subjects during their respiratory illness. They've been uh, estimated and aligned. And now we want to know how this ability to, ability to oxygenate during the illness depends on some physical parameter of individuals. Okay? So I'm thinking of a numerical simple predictor here. Say this is the ratio between the circumference of your chest and your height, which ought to be something that hovers around a half. OK, we want to see if having a larger chest, relatively speaking, is something that helps with oxygenation, for instance. So we do this regression. Uh, you see an equation here, kind of an equation. It's the only one in the whole talk. The thing that I want you to notice is that the effect, the statistical effect of the predictor on the response, it's not a number, as in standard regression. This is actually a curve itself, a curve that describes the way the predictor acts on the response along the domain on which the response unfolds. Okay? So it is this function that we estimate. We have a beta hat x that is the whole curve. Okay? And following my little made up story, we could find out that the relative size of your chest doesn't matter that much in terms of oxygenation early on in the illness. Maybe it matters in its critical part, and then it goes back to mattering very little. Okay? The most statistically oriented among you may wonder if we can also reason uh, inferentially here, and the answer is yes. You can build bands around these estimated curves, and you can run tests that can be global or local at various scales to understand where is it that these effects are significant. OK? A few more words also on, uh, on functional clustering. On the left, you see that I've color coded the curves, uh, and these are cartoons, they're not real curves, in four different colors. These represent four different groups four different ways people were going through this respiratory illness in terms of their ability to oxygenate. So there's the group to which John belongs. They are above baseline in their ability to oxygenate from the very beginning. Once they turn a cor the corner, they start going even farther up. If you look at the group to which Jane belongs, instead they start around baseline, then they drop well below baseline, but then when they finally turn the corner, they start going back up pretty much with the same speed that John's group had. 
You may notice here there are also the very unlucky people. There are some people that don't turn the corner here, right? They don't start going back up, they keep going down. Their illness is obviously very different, okay? So how do I form these groups and how do I identify these sort of distinct typical patterns along the domain? There are many clustering tools that can be used in functional data analysis. One of the simplest is a version of the k-means algorithm working on curves, okay? So there you're, you have to fix the number of groups you're looking for at the outset, let's say it's four. And then you have to somehow initialize the calculation. For instance, you could attribute the various curves random labels. And then you start a loop in which you first compute the patterns. These are just means, okay, of the groups. And then based on the patterns you just computed, you decide what the membership labels are for each curve. And then once you've done that, you go back to calculating the mean patterns and then back to calculating the memberships and so on and so forth until things stop changing, okay? Uh, which we call convergence of some kind. Uh, of course, in doing this, you're going to need a way to measure the distance between two curves. And uh, that's what I'm trying to draw for you on the lower right-hand side, okay? And I'm not going to get any more technical than that, okay? After this brief introduction that I hope was not too painful, uh, and I have another 20 minutes, right, approximately? I hope it wasn't too painful and gave you a little bit of intuition. I'm going to try to switch gear and get into the two applications that I promised I was going to talk about. From the point of view, from a public health point of view, you could classify them both as epidemics, except that they're very, very different from one another. One is an epidemic that concerns a non-transmissible, long-lasting, uh, possibly chronic condition, and one is an epidemic that concerns an infectious disease. So the first one is obesity, uh, a non-transmissible epidemic, but a very, very, very big problem in many Western countries, including the United States. The United States has an extremely large proportion of uh, people, okay, that are either over overweight or obese, and what's worse, this is a phenomenon that is starting more and more to percolate to earlier ages, okay? Even very young children, even infants, can have a propensity to, weigh, to, to gain weight too quickly, okay? And uh, this is problematic because if they do, there is a much higher chance that, they, that this will last, that they will turn into adults that are overweight or obese, and this can lead to a whole bunch of bad consequences for health during their lifetime. So what you may be less familiar with is the fact that Penn State is actually home to very important research on early life weight gain. And this is research led by Ian Paul at the School of Medicine in Hershey, together with several other PIs and collaborators, both at Hershey and at University Park. Um, Ian has led two big studies. One was called INSIGHT and one was called SIPSIGHT. The data that I will talk about today came from INSIGHT, okay? And these were studies that followed a cohort of very small children from birth to two years of age and then later. But this gives you, it frames the situation for you. So when you look uh, uh, at uh, early life weight gain, you can, among the many things that you can do, try and assess the role of uh, omics risk factors, okay? Uh, what role may genetic variants or epigenetic modifications or microbiota composition or metabolites play in this phenomenon, okay? And this is exactly what we did as part of this a uh, uh, very large uh, study together with Katerina Makova, who directs the Center for Medical Genomics, Matthew Reimer, who's a brilliant expert in functional data, and in fact, he should be giving this lecture in my place, 
And then here on the slide, you also see Sarah Craig, who is a research faculty here at Penn State, Anna Kenny, who was a graduate student here and is now an assistant professor at UC Irvine. And of course, there were many, many other people involved. Essentially, at least today, I will focus on the question that you see there in blue. Uh, can we link genetics, okay, genetic variants, to the propensity to gain weight early in life? Things to note, the cohort of kids that we worked with was very small, maybe not so small in terms of other contexts and frameworks, but surely small here. We had a few hundred children. And uh, our aim was to see through hundreds of thousands of variants of, I'll call them mutation, that could have an effect on the phenomenon. Okay, so the cohort size was very small compared to the size of the problem. Okay, uh, another thing to note is that we actually had access to a very nice solid set of covariates on feeding on medication use, on the social demographics of the families in which these children were growing up. And this is very important in a study like this because it helps you control, okay? You can use this covariance as controls as you try to assess whether there is a statistical association between genetic variants and the phenomenon. But perhaps the most important thing that I need to tell you is that these children were measured in terms of weight and length repeatedly over the first two years of age, okay? So we had longitudinal information on how they were growing. Because of this, as we were seeing through these hundreds of thousands of mutations that we wanted to use as predictors, we didn't have to look at, say, a binary outcome. Are you growing too fast or not? Or some kind of numeric outcome, maybe a growth index calculated at two years of age. We had the whole curve, okay? We had information on the whole shape of the growth process over these two years of life. There you see our curves nicely processed, okay? Denoised and aligned, and that's what we used as the response. Now, this is a much harder regression problem than the one I described a few slides ago because it didn't have one or two predictors, a few predictors, it had hundreds of thousands of potential predictors, okay? So we had to apply methods to screen them and select them. But fortunately, Matthew did a lot of work with students and faculty in the SAT department to develop these screening and feature selection methods also for functional regressions, so we had methods to use. And uh, with such a small cohort, and seeing through a multiplicity of weak signals, the genetic signals for this complex type of, of, of uh, uh, conditions are complex and weak, okay, multiple and weak. The richer information in the shape really boosted our ability, the power that we had in identifying these predictive mutations. So we learned many things. Some of the things we learned are, you know, annotated on this slide. I'm not going to read them. I want to try to focus on one, okay? The fact that we were able to use uh, uh, curves, use shapes, was a proof of principle for, for an important notion. If you have rich data, longitudinal data, good covariates, you can, using appropriately strong and sophisticated methods, do GWAS, which means genome-wide association studies, also if your cohort is small, okay? Because you're using smartly a rich type of information at your disposal, even if you don't have that many subjects, okay? Why is this critical? Because it's just the opposite of what the discipline normally says these days. Okay, GWAS studies are getting larger and larger and more and more expensive because when you're trying to tease out these elusive weak signals, okay, it sounds like the only hope you have to gain power is to make the sample size larger and larger and larger. Okay, 
the accompaniment of this is that you build these predictive scores based on genetic variants that involve so many possible mutations, okay, that they become in, unusable in practice, okay? And there is another thing to be said, even assuming that you had an enormous amount of money from the NIH, in some contexts you can get larger cohorts, but in some you simply don't, okay? In rare conditions or for hard to reach populations, your cohorts are gonna be small anyway, okay? So we said something that was a little against the current. Um, I'm not gonna explain the figure, but just in one phrase, we use simulations to show, okay, what would happen if you had, if, if we had many more subjects, but only measured them cross-sectionally, with just one value for each, okay? instead of having the curves. And we simulated that under different noise scenarios. And what it turns out is that in order to have the same power, okay, we would have to have twice as many, four times as many, five times as many, in fact, in realistic scenarios, many more times as many subjects to get the same power that we got with about 200 curves, okay? Quickly, second epidemic that I wanted to talk about, this is a very transmissible disease called COVID-19 that we all, oops, I, sorry, I went two slides in one, that we all are very familiar with, unfortunately. Um, and in particular, we uh, studied the first two waves, the pre-vaccine waves of COVID-19 in Italy. You may remember that Italy was the first Western country to be hit by COVID-19 and that it was hit really, really hard. Uh, it was also one of the countries with the strictest, strictest lockdowns and mandates around the globe. Um, I call this project the COPAS project, which means coping with pandemic stress. And this is something that I did with a bunch of brilliant young statisticians, essentially as a way to stay sane as we were all stranded in different parts of the globe trying to wait for things to go back to some kind of normality. So there, even though they're very tiny, you see Marcia Cremona and Tobia Boschi who were here at Penn State and are now at the University of Laval in Canada and an IBM research in Dublin. You see Jacopo Di Iorio, whom you see also here, he's a postdoc and Eberly fellow here now, and Lorenzo Testa, who is now a graduate student at Carnegie Mellon. So what did we do? We started trying to amass publicly available data, okay? Uh, we wanted to try and see if we could uh, identify distinct patterns that the epidemic was taking in different parts of the country because just by watching the news at night, it sounded pretty clear that there were some very, very different patterns that this thing was taking, okay? And then we wanted to try and relate it to mobility, human mobility, the thing that Google was measuring so effectively during the epidemic, and a bunch of other factors that were social demographic, infrastructure, environmental, et cetera. Um, the problem was that the data was awful, okay? Except for the mobility data, and there Google, we have to give it to them, did a fairly good job. Uh, the data on these um, covariates that we wanted to analyze was very hard to get. We had to use proxies that were often sub suboptimal and um, out of date. And the data on the epidemic was, as probably many of you know, really not very mm -mm, uplifting, okay? Case data was just unusable for Italy. Death data, was a little bit better, <laughs> but it showed inconsistencies and biases. It had, we had to triangulate it, correct it using differential mortality because otherwise we couldn't get, you know, clean usable data, especially not at high resolution. So notwithstanding all of this, in the end, functional data saved the day and we were able to learn a number of things. Again, I'm listing some key results on the slides. I'm not gonna discuss this in great depth. Um, you see here the 
mortality curves and the mobility curves, okay, as we reconstructed them and aligned them uh, for first and second wave. Registration here, alignment was particularly important because location, different locations in Italy were starting their curve at very different points in time. Okay, so we had to register them up properly before we could compare the curves. Okay, and so we ran a clustering type exercise which allowed us to separate three different patterns. One that was almost flat, one that was clearly exponential, and one that was super exponential, if you want, and to locate these different patterns across the country and compare them between the two waves. And then, in addition to this clustering type exercise, we did a regression type exercise in which we tried to study the mortality curve against the, mo the mobility curves and a bunch of other covariates. And we were able to find a consistent, strong signal that, mortality, uh, that mobility was a lagged predictor of mortality in both ways. Okay? Um, now, I hope I convinced you that there's lots of success to be had using this type of tools, but I also want to try and discuss a few perils that come with this. Okay, um, I'm going to try to conclude uh, uh, noting some, uh, some um, issues. Oops, uh, oh, no, I gave it away. This is a very incomplete list of issues that can uh, uh, occur uh, using functional data. The downstream analysis and findings may depend on how we did the preprocessing, okay? On how we estimated the curves and aligned them. There were elements of human judgment in this phase, and these elements of human judgment can very well percolate into final findings. Another issue that can have a, a, a way, a role, is that some of the methods can become computationally taxing, okay? Uh, can have a substantial computational burden. But by and large, the thing that I want to stress here is that when you build this very long, very complex, very articulated analysis pipelines that have delicate preprocessing stages where you have some elements of, of, of you know, arbitrariness, followed by very sophisticated algorithms afterwards, building this stuff up, you inevitably build in an instability, an instability, okay? And this is hardly just a problem of functional data analysis. In a way, you can say that the more sophisticated and powerful is a methodology, the higher is the risk that it has instability built in, okay? Instability comes with power, in a way. So, how can we mitigate this type of peril and produce solid science? So, I don't know how many of you recognize this. This was a cult movie and a cult song. They're gonna date me. I'm trying to make light of an issue that is actually very, very serious. Uh, the idea here is, at least this is one way to go about this, uh, that we can and we ought to shake things. We should shake the pre-processing specifications, we should shake the data, okay, in such a way that we can see what outcomes survive, okay? Instability here means that with small changes in input, the specifications or the data can come large changes in output, okay? And we want to see what survives this shaking. Uh, this should give you a bit more of, a, of an idea of what I'm talking about, and I'm also giving you a reference here to um, an article in PNAS by Binu and co-authors a couple of years ago called Veridical Data Science. She's trying to, 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 to make this point about stability very strongly. So shaking it repeatedly, you can try many, many different preprocessing specifications. And you should do many, many repeated perturbations of the data that can be done in many different ways. And then you rerun the analysis. So instead of one set of results, you actually have many, okay? You can see how they change. Possibly you can build ranges and see what sticks, what survives, okay? 
Is that effect always positive, really? Okay. Is that prediction above historic trends? Does it stay above historic trend if you shake? Now, this is a novel in a way, and in my opinion, ever more urgent focus in statistics, in machine learning, in lots of contemporary data related uh, fields. Okay? But interestingly, it connects with some old, almost traditional, almost old fashioned notions. Okay? For instance, it connects to the notions of robustness and influence in statistics that have been around forever. Okay? Perturbations connect to the whole literature on uh, resampling, which contains the bootstrap, the jackknife, and you know, studies of different types of perturbations that were very important in the last decades of the last century. Uh, it also connects with a whole class of, of techniques for data augmentation and data rebalancing that nowadays have become completely customary in, in uh, machine learning. Okay? Uh, so I wanted to try and raise this as strongly as I can as an issue. Here you see how this shake and repeat take to statistical analysis was used in the examples that I gave you before. Uh, those are R squared for the marginal regressions of mortality on a whole bunch of scalar covariates in this case in the COVID-19 study. What I want you to notice is that for each one of these covariates, the three sticks are very similar to each other. Okay, those came from three different ways of building the mortality curves. The fact that they're similar to each other is reassuring us that the way we're parsing the role of these covariates does not depend on the way we build the mortality curves. Okay, uh, the plot you see on the bottom are actually the beta head curves, the effect curves for uh, mobility on mortality estimated in a concurrent function on function regressions, changing the lag that was used in the concurrent regression. You see that they're similar enough to tell us that if we make a certain interpretation okay, of the fact that mobility is aggravating mortality, that does not depend on the way we picked the lag within a certain range, at least. And the ones up there are actually some of the SNPs that we selected in the childhood obesity study, okay? And that was the plot that mapped them, not just in terms of how strong their effect was, but also in terms of how often they were reselected if we repeated the selection on several different subsets of the cohort at our disposal. Our scores, they have either 20 or five SNPs in them, were built using the SNPs that were the strongest and, and the most consistent under perturbation. Okay? Um, take on messages if I have another minute, I, I'll take it. The beauty of FDA, it gives us a lot of leeway in terms of the density or sparsity and the location of the measuring posts we use along the domain. These can be different across subjects. It is also very cool because it allows us to cope with and mitigate, remove, it's a strong word, but let's go there. Irrelevant variation both vertically and horizontally. Okay? It also has a vast repertoire of tools that we can use. We talked about regression and clustering, but there are many, many more. I gave you, I showed you two biomedical applications, the study of two epidemics. In the first, I tried to make the point that even though our cohort was very small and the signals were very weak, we were in a position using FDA to build usable genetic risk scores for weight gain in infants. And in the second example, I tried to make the point that notwithstanding the extremely poor and inconsistent nature of the data we had on COVID-19, we were able, using FDA, to uh, uh, define, identify distinct mortality patterns across the country and link mortality to mobility in a way that seems rather stable. I added a warning 
which again is hardly just about functional data analysis, it's more general. Pre-processing specifications and sophisticated methodology can make outcomes unstable. So if we want science to be solid and reproducible, we need mitigation strategies, okay? This is something I, I talk to you about this shake and repeat thing. Of course, there may be other approaches. This is something that in a way, if there are any social scientists among you, generalizes the notion of what they call robustness tests on, on their, especially economists love robustness tests. Um, if we want to produce conclusions that are not ephemeral, that don't go away <laughs> uh, after 15 minutes and a few sneeze before you rerun your code, okay? And especially if we want, don't want to be dangerous, because some conclusions can also be dangerous, we should be very careful about this stuff. So thank you to all my extraordinary and brilliant collaborators here and around the world. Everything I talked about is quintessentially teamwork, and there's nothing that is just done by one person alone. Uh, here you see a few institutions and funding agencies that have been involved over the years. I thank you for uh, spending time with me today and listening to me blabbing. Oops. If you're interested in, you know, going a little deeper on some of these things, these are a bunch of references that you can read to learn more about the projects that I talked about. Done. Now the questions. Thank you, Francesco, Dr. Francesco, for your great talk. Thank you. So much. We will take questions from the audience. So if you have any questions, please use the code and tell me it's just like a All right. High tech questions. <laughs> All right. So the first question is since when you were talking about your pre processing, this, this smoothing and this realignment, it all depends on, on tuning and mm -hmm. all the subjectivity. Then, how can we trust later inference that we're doing? And does the freedom of functional methodology allow for inflated positive rate, uh, results? So, I think I kind of got to this question with the last part of my talk. Okay? So, uh, uh, there, louder. Oh, I repeat the question. So what are, sorry, what are, the ro what, what are the risks associated with these elements of human judgment that I was mentioning when I was talking about reconstructing the curves and aligning them, okay? Smoothing and registering, okay? What consequences can this arbitrariness have on conclusions and is there a risk of uh, having false positives, okay? Did I? Uh, yes. Okay. So I think I was getting to this with the last part of my talk. Um, there are things that statisticians do to make the tuning less arbitrary, okay? Cross-validation, generalized cross-validation techniques can be used to tune the tuning parameter, okay, or parameters in some of these procedures. So we're not completely lost. There are some ways that we can get one <laughs> solution, okay, out of the many. But that doesn't mean that that solution is hugely better than other ones, okay? There is always an element of arbit arbitrariness and, again, human judgment. So the idea is if you have to do this complicated pre-processing and complicated analysis pipeline type of things, please do it many times over. Try many, many different options, as many as you possibly can, because in the end, if the signals that you're grabbing onto are strong enough, they survive, okay? This by itself should curb false positives a lot, specifically for the selection of uh, predictive mutations in the childhood obesity problem. Uh, uh, repeating uh, the selection and focusing on the things that were not just being selected once, false positive, but many times over, maybe not so false positive, was one way to go about this. I don't know if I answered, but I tried. The point is that you don't know who asked you the question. You can't look them in the eye while you answer. Okay, go. So similar to the COVID-19 example, when your data are poor, sometimes FDA can save the day, but at what point do you determine if the data are just so unusable? Eh. Um, 
that I don't know that I have. A, a, a <laughs> Sorry. OK. So uh, uh, this shift to the COVID-19 thing, and you say the data is bad, and FDA can save the day. But how do you know when the data is really, really, really bad, and there's nothing you can do with it? And I don't know that I have an answer, guys. You just analyze a whole lot of data in your life, and at some point, you start getting a sense of it, right? You start getting it. But again, this notion of repetition, OK, is important. And this is especially if you're not just trying to demonstrate how powerful your new statistical tool is, which also requires a lot of repetition. But if you're trying to make science, OK? You're working in some scientific domain. There is always another way to get another type of data that maybe can help you validate or not what your analysis seems to be suggesting. In the case of COVID, as I was trying to hint, for instance, case data we simply forgot about because we were doing some checks. You know, We were uh, adding up the data at the level of provinces and see if it matched the data that was published at the level of regions. Regions are clusters of provinces, and it didn't. But it didn't by orders of magnitude. Okay, So you just throw it out. There's nothing you can do with it. For mortality, they didn't want to give it at high resolution because of uh, privacy issues. Okay, uh, But there were things that you could do also in terms of, of seeing how mortality was vastly underestimated at the beginning and then maybe overestimated later on by comparing it to differential mortality. Okay, you, you probably have heard about this. You could compare total death counts in those months, in those periods, to those that were typical on average on a certain number, number of prior years. Okay? That differential mortality was a way to indirectly get at the mortality impact of the epidemic. Okay? In many, many settings, there are things like this that you can do.